Hi, this is Peter Kinesche with Medievalist.net, and I'm here with the uh, Steve Noche. He's the author of The Friar of Carcassonne, which uh, just came out uh, in hardcover. It's available uh, throughout throughout the world, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a, a very interesting story set in uh, like the 13th and 14th centuries uh, in southern France, where you uh, come and it's about a, a brother Bernard. And uh, first of all, can you tell us a little bit about him and how you came to find about him, about his story? Well, Brother Bernard, Bra Brother Bernard, it was Bernard de Lisieux. He was a Franciscan friar uh, around the year 1300. And he did what had never been done before and it would never be done again. He led a revolt against the Inquisition and shut it down for four or five years. And doing this, he enlisted the help of the most dangerous king ever to sit on the French throne, a real Viper, King Philip the Fair, the same man who crushed the Templars. Mm -hmm. And he also, uh, you know, incited riot in the town of Carcassonne. So he was a, he was a politician of genius. He was an orator. He's like, he's like a major figure that has been overlooked. Uh, and he also was animated by his Franciscan purist faith that to combat heresy, you don't use coercion and torture. You use example. So he was one of those Franciscans called the spiritual Franciscans. So I came to be interested in this story because I, I, about 10 years ago I wrote a book about the Cathars the, and the Albigensian Crusade. And I came across Bernard's story, which occurs to in the last days of the Cathars. Um, I came across his story when I was searching that book, but I didn't have, really have that much uh, information about it. So he sort of lodged in the back of my mind for several years while I did other things. And then, um, given the tenor of the times, our times, uh, I thought of Bernard de Lisieux, someone who was fighting against torture and secret trials. And I was thinking, maybe this is a, an interesting story. So I went, and in the intervening time, it's the, the time that I, I um, wrote The Perfect Heresy and looked back at Bernard, all of his trial transcripts, he was tried in 1319, dozens of witnesses were called, and most of these trial transcripts have survived. And they were eyewitness accounts of his campaign against the Inquisition. And they had been translated from Latin into the French in the year 2000, 2001. So this was accessible to me, to a storyteller, to a writer of narrative history. And it's an unparalleled source, because you, you, could almost, you almost know what he had for breakfast on any given day. But, but you, we have different accounts of his famous sermons, and one he compared himself to Jesus Christ in Carcassonne to Jerusalem. Uh, we know all of the actions of his campaign, told by people who lived it uh, before a court. And so there are about 50 testimonies. And it wasn't, I should stress, it wasn't an Inquisition trial. It was a straight trial where he, where he was given the chance to defend himself. So he was charged on charges of obstructing the position, black magic, murder of a pope, and heresy. So the usual phantasmagorical uh, medieval charges, you know, fornication, sodomy, that sort of thing. But he was found guilty. He confessed not to obstructing corrupt inquisitors, which he had maintained all along, but for desiring the abolition of the Inquisition, which was heresy. So he was thrown in jail, and he died about a month, a month later after being tortured. So, but though that trial happened 15 years after his moments, his five years of glory in Carcassonne. And it's, yeah, it's a, a fascinating uh, story of, a, of a, an individual. It's also a kind of fascinating story of the city of Carcassonne, this medieval French uh, city. And I was just wondering what your thoughts about it, about that place, and as being kind of a, a, a place of kind of a spiritual center in Europe. Yeah, well, Carcassonne is very interesting. Carcassonne is not, I should say, it's not very interesting in the summer when it's completely overrun by every tour bus from Romania to Brighton. But in the winter, it's like this medieval grandee that is still with us. You know, it like, sits on a hill that's majestic, it's beautiful, it's forbidding. Uh, it was much, uh, it was much renovated by Vieux de Duc in the 19th century, but still its authenticity survives. So in Bernard's time, uh, and for a, uh, quite a long time, that beautiful medieval city that you see on the hill was where the royal and episcopal and inquisitorial power was. You know, 
So on the other side of the river Ode, the lower town, is where there were the bourgeois, the burghers, the nobles, the tradesmen. And this was a, a teeming city of ambition, of resistance to French authority, because French authority was very new there. In Bernard's time, uh, Carcassonne and the Languedoc had only been part of the Kingdom of France for 20 years. You know, the language was different. So Carcassonne having been inhabited since before the Romans, you know, the site is, is a wonderful site, has a, has a tremendous, what I find, spiritual energy to it. That, you know, if you're sensitive to these things, walking on the streets of medieval Carcassonne in, let's say, a gray February day is one of the most enjoyable things you can do. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, also, uh, I want to ask you, this is your third kind of history book that kind of deals with the Middle Ages, and you, a lot of it, your works kind of deal with religion, things like the Inquisition, heresies, um, Islam, and Christianity. How did you wind up getting interested in that aspect of the, of the Middle Ages? Well, I think it's pretty fairly hard to write about the Middle Ages without writing about religion. You know, it's like writing about the earth and not talking about its atmosphere. You know, it, you know medieval man breathed religion. It was so, so much part of his uh, and her worldview. So you're sort of inevitably uh, drawn to that. And I, I should say that you know those books that you just mentioned, like one on the Cathars, or two on the Cathars, right? but also the fight food fight between the Dominicans and the Franciscans. And the other one about Islam and Christianity's getting along and not getting along all around the med medieval Mediterranean, it's the intersection of politics with religion. This is what I'm interested in, politics. And also, as a, as a writer, as opposed to an academic writer, I'm also interested in some techniques of storytelling where you use a sense of place a very good evocation of a place to create a sense of time because you know the Middle Ages are so far away it's a, it's a foreign country you know, when, you, when you travel to a foreign country and you can't speak the language suddenly you become very fascinated by food and smells and tastes because you've lost the senses of speech and hearing you compensate so I think that the Middle Ages is is so distant and so strange that I try to bring the reader in by appealing to his other senses so that he'll stay at the table, so to speak. So, um, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's, uh, I think it's very difficult not to uh, talk about religion in the Middle Ages, and of course, as a lapsed former altar boy, I was sort of bathed in Catholicism <laughs> oh. <laughs> when I was uh, from, and I went to parochial schools, so uh, uh, it's the typical trajectory. Well, I also found that your, your works are very relevant to today, like you're talking about, you know, ideas of torture and the Inquisition, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of, you know, the conflict uh, or, or the relations between Islam and Christianity today are still very relevant as they were uh, back a thousand years ago, so. Yeah, and I, you know, I don't want to be, uh, I'll confess, uh, I don't want to be an ambulance chaser, you know, when the September, 9, September 11, uh, 2001 happened, I was just beginning the research on this Islam and Christianity. And I just downed to it. I said, no, I don't want to appear to be an station. But then, after several months, I realized that people were not taking the long view. You know, they were treating uh, the relationship between Christianity and Islam just as the Crusades or colonialism. There's this whole shared rich history, particularly of the medieval period. There was jockeying going on for control of the Mediterranean, and also great moments of convergence faiths got together. So yes, I'm, I, I'm not sort of saying we must learn from the lessons of the past, but I just think that there are, we need more reference. You know, in, I live in the United States and sometimes you think that the only two events ever to have happened was Munich, 1938, <laughs> yeah. and, the sec and Pearl Harbor, that's the, and maybe the Civil War. That's the only three things that, you know, you read the newspapers and that's, you know, ah, oh, this is like Munich, this is like I just think that it's, you know, we should air out our collective memory, like take things out of the closet every now and then and dust them off for the, for the each generation should do that. Yeah. Uh, and just, I, it's always uh, odd to ask an author who just finished a book, but are you planning any other kind of other research and going uh, in other new fields? Or I am. I'm actually um, 
considering a medieval romance. Ah. A fiction, yes. Oh, okay. No, yes. I see the director giving me the thumbs up over there. Yes, a, a nice, pure romance about love. Just at the time when the, the idea of romantic love was beginning, which is our which is the medieval period. Uh, something sort of to escape from the tweets and Twitters of this complex age. Well, again, thank you so much for talking with us. Your book is called The Friar of Carcassonne. And it's available throughout the world, I would guess. Well, in the Anglo world. We'll see if it gets translated. But Hopefully yeah, it will. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you.